Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and reminding you that Dakotist, the second edition, is now available on Kindle. It's either $2.99 or $5.99. You know how they play with the price, but it's not ever going to be more than $5.99. I put that price on it so that everybody can get this biblical thriller that reveals the most diabolical plan to annihilate the Jews to keep Jesus from coming back. It's a must read and it has five stars all over the place. You can get it at Amazon in paperback and in Kindle. And don't forget to visit ignitingnation.com and scroll down to the bottom of the page and you'll see my latest book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. Click on the picture, it'll ask for your email address and we'll give you the first chapter for free. I can assure you there are seven very specific areas that God is showing us supernatural revelation through natural things like the dirt, the bark, the trunk of a tree have such rich meaning that you have no idea until you embrace this concept of lessons learned from the tree of life. <clears throat> I'm uh, delighted to introduce you to uh, one of our favorite publishers, Chosen Books, uh, author <clears throat> and writer Julie Meyer who has written a book called Seeing the Scriptures, How All Believers Can Experience Breakthrough, Hope, and Healing with a Forward by Heidi Baker. Julie Meyer, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be with you. Well, it's exciting. I know that uh, it was a little challenging for you technology-wise over the last uh, couple the of days. The Skype thing was. <laughs> But but uh, I don't know why my computer didn't want it. <laughs> well, it didn't want it, but it got it, and you know it got it. <clears throat> we always take that as a sign of encouragement that only those on the front line get shot, and so we go. we must we must are about to have some breakthrough during this interview time that the enemy did not want the world to hear. And I, I agree, because so, it was crazy, so absolute I'm, nuts. <laughs> yes, I'm encouraged by that. So let's go back to your, your beginnings. Who is Julie Meyer? Where did she grow up? What were her influences? How did she come to be a psalmist, which is the category, you know, the, the world has this term praise and worship that's one word. Uh, it's become the new model. And I don't understand it because I'm Jewish and I come from the world of the psalmists where mm. we set the psalms to music and that became our liturgy. We set the book of Deuteronomy to music wow. and we sing and chant the book of Deuteronomy. We sing and chant the psalms and we've been doing it that way for 5,000 years and <clears throat> it is worship. And mm -hmm. it fulfills our calling as our Creator created us to worship Him. That was our purpose in life. And there are very few, like yourself, who are willing to teach. Uh, Jack Hayford said to me one day, if, you, if worship has not changed you, you have not worshipped. Mm. So where was it in your upbringing that this message took hold? Uh, you know, I've always loved music. I'm from a very small town in the middle of Kansas called Womago, Kansas. And uh, even as a small child, before I knew the Lord, I didn't know Jesus till I was 17. Um, anytime uh, I was sad, I would go play my piano and I would sing the hymns. I think the hymns that I learned at Sunday school, and one of them was um, a sweet hour of prayer, you know, sweet hour of prayer. I mean, I just remember singing that when I was young. I I got a piano, I think, uh, when I was in second Give grade. Give me a favor. Don't, don't, always... don't, don't, don't stop there. Give me a couple of, of, of verses of that. Sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer that calls us to a world of care. I don't know it all by memory, but I remember that that part. I remember 
Um, and that's something. Uh, you, and you know that, what? I haven't sang that song for years. That's the power of singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. They stay with you. Yes, but and they it reminds me that it's sweet, and that an hour is too short for a conversation with God. Oh my <laughs> that's goodness! That's what that reminds me. You know what's interesting is I take groups to Israel every year, and I do my trips very different than anybody else because I start out in Haifa. Uh, we land in Tel Aviv and go to Haifa, and we wake up on Saturday morning and we go to Kehilat HaKarmel, which is the congregation on the top of Mount Carmel where Elijah mm. met the prophets of Baal. And they're introduced, they're immersed into Davidic praise and worship. And the first hour is worship. It's not you know, uh, two praise, one worship, take up an offering, give a message. It's one hour of entering in to the presence of God where you enter his gates with thanksgiving, you enter his court with praise, and you enter his holy of holies, bow down low in worship. This was the model given mm -hmm. to us in the tabernacle. This was in the tabernacle and then in the temple. And so... Uh, uh, you found in this hymn, in times of trouble, these became your handlebars, what you grabbed yeah. a hold of. Um, I always talk about the handlebars, the crossbars. The, you put your hands and grabbed a hold of that way where Jesus put his hands, and you put them right on top of his hands and grabbed a hold of it because that's where you found comfort. Yeah, I did. I found comfort there before I realized, before I knew God. Um, you know, that music was always uh, my passion. I grew up playing classical piano, but I gave, I found the Lord at 17. So at 17, I just, I started writing songs from the Bible, but I always loved psalms because they were already songs and they were already prayers. And uh, I just found that I could go to the Psalms and every single emotion was covered in those Psalms. I loved David's honesty. So no matter what I was going through in life, I could find it in those 150 chapters. And that became my landing point, my spring board into God. And then, of course, you know, I love the Bible. I love reading it from the front to the back. But that the very foundation of my life in God started in Psalms. They became easy songs to sing and write. And uh, I came from a musical family. My aunt's were very musical. So I loved to just open the Psalms and make up a melody. And um, it was just later in life that I began to really study it. And of course, um, later in life, I came to know the Lord at 17 and I was all in. When I gave my life to the Lord, I didn't experience burnout, falling away. I was all in. <laughs> and I met uh, Mike Bickle in 1983, and he, everything that he did, you know, he started the House of Prayer in Kansas City, of which I was a part of, but even the early, we used to have prayer meetings three times a day, at 6 a.m., at noon, and at 7, and it was always praying the Bible or singing the Bible, and at one of those 6 a.m.s, it was 1983, at a 6 a.m. prayer meeting, Mike came up because I was scared to pray on the mic. I don't know why. <laughs> I, I, I was like, I don't know how to pray on a mic. And he came and he sat by me and he goes, you know what? Take this, this psalm. And he opened up Psalm 31. I still remember. It's mm. like one of those bookmark moments. And he started telling me about David. You know, when David's cry for dis distress and he goes, go up and take this psalm, open it up and sing it. And he said, your song will, will be your prayer. And that I just, that's how I started praying and singing the Bible. And then of course, years later, when the house of prayer started, we based everything off praying the Bible to keep people on 
track and praying and singing the apostolic prayers. So it has always been part of my life. In fact, I remember Mike teaching, um, uh, he, he called it the linger factor. And he said, if you don't know the Bible, if you don't understand a portion of scripture along with your meditation and study, sing it. Because when you sing it, you actually linger there long enough for Ephesians 1, 17 through 19 to be actually working in your life. Because if you just read it, it's you're reading it. But when you sing it, it it's like you put yourself into that story and you stay there long enough for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to shine on your heart, open it up so that you have a knowledge of Jesus. And I think that is the very, before I understood Davidic worship, I was doing it. That's so incredible to me because you would think that the order would be you came to faith and then you began to walk in this gift. But this gift was given to you and you were praying hymns, playing hymns and finding comfort in hymns before you found comfort in the author and and the subject matter mm -hmm. of the hymn. Uh, yeah. Once that, that marriage took place and you married yourself to the word of God with your gift of music, all of a sudden now the Psalms come to light. And uh, look, Psalm 119. Uh, Psalm 13, uh, Psalm 13, f for years, I was going through a very, 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 very difficult time in my life. And I would drive to go preach. And I had Psalm 13, and I forget who the musician was that put it, set it to music and played it over and over again. Whole lo how long, O oh Lord, how long, O oh Lord, would... Will you be silent? How long will you allow sorrow in my heart? I, but I will rejoice and I will praise you all, all my days. And so I found such... The How a, Long Song. Right, the How Long Song. It's exactly right. And, and wept and wept before the Lord, uh, understanding the Psalms of Ascent, uh, going to Israel every year and standing at the base of of what would have been the lowest step and knowing what is being cantillated, chanted at that time and the order in which the ascent takes place and mm -hmm. that Jesus himself would chant, sing those psalms of ascent as he was an observant Jew and he was able to be a part, and they called him rabbi, and they treated him as one who had knowledge. So he, we want to know what was Jesus doing as a boy. He was learning scripture. Mm -hmm. He was learning the Psalms. They were committed to memory. For you, I know Psalm 91 is that, is that spiritual warfare that is, the, it's the breaker song. Um, how have you um, taken Psalm 91 and, and put the Julie Meyer touch to that? Well, I have it right now. I'm actually singing my way through the Psalms. And I've sang Psalm 1 to Psalm uh, 27. And we are releasing this. We have an online community called Into the River. So I'm, I'm literally going every single month and singing my way through the Psalms. So when you say Psalm 13, I can go to how long, how long, how long, how long. And I feel like when I'm singing these that I get and I don't know how it works, but I almost feel like. I get the emotions of David yes. because when I, I, I study it and then I sing it. And so when I started singing that, how long, how long, I mean, when I started singing it, I, I just got this, I felt like the spirit of the Lord was just stirring me up and I had this longing of how long. And I, I don't know how all that works, but I know that. With Psalms 91, sometimes I think 
the best warfare is a love song. Yes. That's what worked for Esther. So when people say, we want warfare, I mean, sometimes I go to the, um, God, set my feet a dancing, you know, um, through you, God, we shall do valiantly. I mean, sometimes I go there, but sometimes I just go to, I love you, because that moved the heart of the king for Esther. Yes. And so I, I think it's both when I think of Psalms 91 and I haven't got there yet, I feel like the Lord leads me because when I when I release these Psalms, I ask what key? I mean, I, they're all in different keys. You know, I, I, it, I, I just um, but when I when I pray Psalms 91, especially over my family, uh, it comes out very tender and very and very sweet, even in the midst of war because I'm seated, I'm placed in the sanctuary, in the shelter of the Most High. So it's almost like I see myself as a little bird under the eagle's wings. And in that place of war, I really am only looking with my eye because I can see myself in the storyline. When you sing it, you actually Put yourself in that storyline. You can see almost what David is seeing. And I just picture myself as that little eaglet bird. And I'm totally comforted. I'm covered from anything my eyes might see. That's where I go when I pray uh, Psalms 91. Julie, back when I was a congregational rabbi, I preached uh, two sermon series. One was called The Anatomy of Worship. And the other one was called the anatomy of praise. And as we look at these terms, praise and worship, they're broken down in Hebrew into seven very distinct categories, much different than what we embrace in the English. And the things that you are talking about, which are thanksgiving, which are love, which are adoration, which are halal, praise, true praise, uh, shacha, which is to bow down low in worship, mm -hmm. just to go so deep and to go so far. I used to do healing services, healing, deliverance, and infilling services that would start at 7 o'clock p.m. and end at 5 or 6 or 7 o'clock the next morning and never took a break. Uh, I had a sanctuary where I played the Psalms 24 hours a day, seven days a week through the system so that God, the Spirit of God, never was given a reason to leave. You see, mm. we always want, we always say, we, oh, we invite the Holy Spirit. Well, why do you have to invite the Holy Spirit? Why, <laughs> I know. why did it leave? I agree. Why did it leave? So because we, <laughs> lock, go? yeah, we lock our churches, we turn off our lights, we turn off our sound system, and we don't fill that space, we don't fill that darkness. And God gave me a vision and said, you play my word 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And when you congregate, I will be there with you because I have no reason to leave. You prepared a place for me where I will take up residence and I will not depart from here. And we don't read of the Holy Spirit leaving the temple until the temple itself was destroyed. The Holy Spirit did not leave it. And so we're given these examples in the Old Testament of how King Solomon built the temple and how the processional was and how the Holy Spirit came and how he dedicated the temple. Now we have this naos, this, this temple, our bodies that are now the temple of the Lord and we are to be worshiping and bringing breakthrough and hope and healing by doing what? Praying God's word back to him, but even more than that, singing back mm -hmm. to him. Why? Because it says when the seraphim cried out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts who was and is and is to come that the 24 elders fell down in worship mm -hmm. and they sang kadosh, 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 Adonai Sava'ot, mm -hmm. holy, holy, holy is yeah. the Lord yeah. of hosts. Mm -hmm. And so you know that this opens the door. It is the key to God's heart that music does so much. Uh, there's music therapy. 
you tell in your yeah. book, you talk in your book about how music actually changes, heals our brains and heals our bodies. How, what did you find? Well, I just started seeing in my own life that um, uh, I, I seem to get breakthrough. And I, I share my testimony, part of it in a chapter two about, you know, just even though I love Jesus for most of that my life, I didn't have a breakthrough that I really knew he loved me until, and it's in chapter two, this two hour session at the house of prayer when my worship leader saw my struggle and he said, for the next two hours, you can only sing one scripture. And we were doing a worship with the word, which is at the house of prayer. It's line by line singing through the word. And he said for, for two hours, the only thing you can sing is Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse five, I am dark, but lovely in my weakness. Jesus says, I'm beautiful. He pursues me. He loves me. And for two hours, I sang in my weakness, I'm beautiful. I am dark, but lovely. You say I'm lovely in my weakness. And all I know is when I started singing it, I still felt weak. But but I just gave myself, I just kept singing, I am dark but lovely. I still remember it. I still remember, even in my weakness, Jesus loves me. This was 19, oh, no, this was 19 or 2000. I still remember it. Even in my weakness, you still pursue me. I mean, and somewhere in that two-hour period, my thoughts about me were 100% replaced with God's thoughts about me. And this is the key. I've never went back. Bam! I got it. He loves me, period. And then what I did is I, I went on an experiment and I, I just said, okay, I because I, I didn't know the science behind singing. And I just said, for the next two years, Anytime I'm mad, frustrated, anytime a negative emotion hit my heart, I was going to sing the Bible, mm. sing the Psalms. And so if I was, if I felt d disappointed, frustrated, if I felt offense trying to land, if I needed to forgive, I, my experiment was, I'm going to sing the Psalms. And every single time that emotion I was feeling was totally overpowered by the song of scripture. And I thought, this works. And that's when I started studying about David. That David, some commentaries say that he went to war with a sword in his hand and a song on his lips. Amen. And I started, I started going, why in the most dire of situations when Saul is trying to kill him, does he say, I sing to the Lord a new song? And so, you know, then I found I'm they're singing all through the word. You know, Moses sang, Miriam sang, Deborah sang, you know, and she sang to herself, wake up, wake up, Deborah, wake up and sing out a song and be a voice. And I started singing when I, or just experimenting when I needed to stir up the spirit of God, when I needed to calm down my e emotional state, I would sing, wake up, wake up, Julie, wake up and be a voice. I took these songs from the Old Testament. And what I found out is I just thought, why does this work? And at one of my workshops, there was a man there and he said, my best friend is a brain surgeon. And he said, I can tell you this about singing, that when you sing, it's one of the only things that the brain does where it actually works together and functions as one. That's why you can't think of all these other negative things when you sing and especially when you sing the word of God because it's a lot and it gets in you. And that's when I, I began to study and found out that the 
left side of the brain is our talk. It's our what I'm doing now. But when you add, when you add a tone to it, even if you sing on the same key, that's your right side. But when you add a rhythm, I'm going to add a rhythm to my words, that's the back. And then the emotional response we get, that's why I can still remember, sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, because it had an emotional response when I was in second grade, I can still remember. And so it's like when we sing, our brain is functioning as one, almost as if it's a helmet. It's almost as if, Ephesians 6 is all wrapped up into the song because nothing, no negative emotion, nothing can get in our brain except the words and the song we're singing. That's why it has such an effect on the brain and the body. And there's scientific and medical evidence that they're using singing and song for tools of stroke victims and Alzheimer's. But I'm like, they just focus on singing. I'm adding the Davidic. Okay, let's not just sing a song. Let's put the, the powerful word of God in there that is alive. And that, I think that's chapter five. And mm -hmm. that's why singing works. That's why um, I've been going down to a, a homeless shelter and we call it music class. I don't preach, I don't pray. All we do is musical. I, uh, I have a, a, a CD that I take and I put it on and I say, we are, we're gonna turn to the Psalms and you can sing it or you can rap it, which is a chant, you know? And these men and women, I have seen miraculous things when they just rap, chant, sing the Bible. They have sobered up right in front of me. Their life has begun to change right in front of me. And it's, I, I don't pray, I don't preach, all I do is have them sing the Bible. And when I go in there, they're still doing it. I can hear it when I walk in the door. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. I love the Lord because he listens. Psalm 116 verses 1 and 2. And what they got, they love God because they had an understanding. God listens. And this is powerful. I believe that we're going to see this Davidic worship arise in the earth, like in the time of David, that God is breathing on it again. We're seeing it shut down riots. That's in one of my chapters. And it is, I think we're going to see the Levites go in to the hardest places to the hardest riots and open up the Bible and sing just like David did and shut it down with the power of the word and song. Julie, let me rock your world for just a minute. There's no Hebrew word for brain. Oh, oh wow. Because a man does not think with his brain, a man thinks with his heart. Uh huh. So when you begin to sing like David sang, and you begin to dance like David danced, mm -hmm. you're singing from your heart. It's out of the abundance of the heart. Of the heart. And so King David said, the word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you, O Lord. And this is why when he went into battle singing, it was out of the abundance of his heart, his adoration, his adulation, his edification, his fear, Mm -hmm. His human frailties, his repentance, his circumcision of his heart, all expressed through psalm, through songs. Mm -hmm. And so what you're doing is you're actually using what God has created as this place of endorphins and this place of dopamine, and this place of oxytocin, and all these things that are created up in here. And when the heart is tied to it, and we're now 
coming and speaking from the heart, which is where the Word of God lives, right, then all of a sudden there is this unity. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. But we have to be at one first with ourselves before That's we can good. become one with the Lord. And the compounding, when you add one voice upon another, all right? When I add my voice to your voice, I'm not diminishing my voice. I'm increasing. We bring the increase that way. And when we sing with one heart, one voice, and one spirit, we're breaking down every stronghold. We're breaking down every wall because that's why they went around seven times around that wall at Jericho, seven times to circumvent that wall, to walk the circumference of it, claiming it for the Lord. And then what was it? It was a musical tone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A shofar blast is a musical tone. It is a note that is being played that caused that wall to fall down. It was because they did it in complete unity. They were one with God. And when you're singing God's word, you are one with God. Yeah, that's so good. If the brain is doing things, but there is no word for brain because it's a man does what his heart thinks and it's, out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. And so the brilliance of this is that we know that God's word does not return void. Now when you, when you become like a choir of angels and those mm -hmm. who have the ability to be surrounding the throne as the cherubim, the seraphim, and the angels and the angelic hosts crying out and singing in psalm in unity, confirmed in their holiness the two-thirds of the heavenly hosts that now surround the throne, praising and lifting up yeah. the name of God, the name above one name, <laughs> of all, the name above all names. There is this incredible breakthrough, and you've been able to capture that in the text of singing the scriptures. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, I want you to think about, when we come back from break, I want you to open with one of the psalms you just recently shared. Pick whichever one you want of the 13 or 14 that you're, that you're doing in this, this program that you've set up, and then afterwards tell us how we can start participating in that. So we're going to take a short break. When we return from break, we're going to go right to Julie and right into her singing a psalm for you, singing the scriptures. Bye. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Igniting a Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the books and media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live, four-hour daily Christian television talk show program.
The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the Donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media, and through your financial support. We know you have many choices and who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Back. Shalom. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we are having a delightful time, spirit-filled, Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled, Davidic, Jewish, believing conversation with Julie Meyer, author of Singing the Scriptures, how all believers can experience breakthrough, hope, and healing. Julie, you've been doing this psalm, uh, taking the psalms and setting them to music. You now have this group you formed that are now uh, each week hearing one more psalm added to the list. Share with us now, if you will, one of those psalms. <laughs> This is Psalms 25. Trust in you, God. 
So that is Psalm 25, which some of it is through the New Living Translation, and some of it on this one is from the Passion Translation, because I like to make them so personal. Um, um, so um, anyway, and in that, I love Psalms 25. I've loved it for years, but when I sing about it, and even though it's David saying, when you think of me, mm -hmm. See me as the one you love. When I sing it and when we, we begin to sing it, we put ourselves in the story. So it's not just us singing David's encounter. But when I sing this, I'm there. I mean, I, I can sing my way to faith. I Right now, I bring my life to you. I hope in you. So if I'm... If I feel discouragement, whatever, I can go to Psalm 25 and be right there. Because when I sing David's me, it's mine. <laughs> if you, that makes sense. Truly, what you're describing is, if you remember, uh, David made the decision that he was going to take on Goliath. And Saul said, let me put my armor on you. And it was way too big. It was just didn't fit. And, and David said, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll wear my own armor. I'll, I'll take care of my own defense. And he picked the five smooth stones and went about it. When we look at the negative side of soul ties, uh, we're always talking about breaking soul ties, breaking soul ties, breaking soul ties. But there also is a side of a soulish connection with David that is beneficial because David represents every one of our own life experiences and sufferings. Mm -hmm. The death of a child, uh, the mm -hmm. rejection of divorce, the betrayal, the loss of a close friend, um, uh, making a mistake, um, being faithful, loyal, and, and being um, 
um, committed as he was to um, uh, to his to his to his best friend who gave his life for mm -hmm. him. There's not a situation in our life that we can't turn to at the soulish level and plug right into the line of David, which is exactly who who uh, Jesus is in the line of David. We get to plug into that living water, that living blood. Yeah. Uh, in your book, you talk about seeing for yourself and by yourself versus corporate worship. And there's a different. Uh, there's a difference in what's called in Hebrew yachad, which is uh, unity of the body. Uh, but then I have my own way of communication. And people are constantly looking for uh, an understanding of a prayer language, uh, looking for a way to communicate with God that can't be stolen uh, is, is something personal. And I think what you've done is you've actually taken some of the mystique out of this concept of what is a true prayer language. Is it a foreign tongue that makes no sense or is it actually... Uh, a language that God's already given us, which is his word. And it's the tone, it's the music, it's the resonation, it's the personalization of playing, not just reciting God's word back to him, but playing God's word back to him and expressing our longing, our need, our woundedness, our, 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 our brokenness through this and heal us through your word. I'm reminding you of your true nature when you think of me, Lord, think of me now, the way I am right now, humbled and contrite with a broken heart and Lord, clean my heart, renew mm -hmm a right spirit within me. Lord, change me. I want there to be change, but it must begin with me. And mm -hmm. this is what David did through the Psalms. And I think now what you're doing is you're putting it on steroids and you're equipping every person to have this way. What do you say to the person that just says, you know, I, I'm just don't, I just don't sing very well. I, I don't, I, I'm not a very good, I, I'm, not, I'm not that good. Then I say, this, is, this book is for you. I actually wrote this. I mean, it, it will benefit the worship community, but I wrote it for people that don't sing because I have experienced so much breakthrough and healing and just that heart to heart with the Lord that I begin to say, why should the worship community only be the ones to get this? And just even in my first chapter, when I'm talking about this grandpa that was like in his 70s, for he gave his life to the Lord in his early teens. And from his early teens to, to when he was at my prophetic singing workshop, he said, he said, I always felt like I was a servant in the house of the king and that at any minute I was going to get asked to go back out of his presence into the servants' quarters. And he, but he did this prophetic singing workshop, be, and he was not a singer. He just was there. And I, I like to have people sing the Psalms three ways. Number one, word for word, so it gets in you. Blessed is the one who does not take counsel in the guilt just word for word. Number two, what I just did, sing it and make it your own prayer. I took the psalm, I made it my own prayer. But number three, sing the other side as if God were singing to you because mm -hmm. it's his thoughts about you. And when this grandpa began to sing, it was Psalms 116 verses one and two. I love the Lord because he hears my cry and my supplication because he bends down and listens. I will pray as long as I breathe. When I was having this workshop, and it was in the early 2000s, 
when I was having this workshop and, and I said, this time, sing it as if God were singing to you. And I said, put your name in there. You know, I love your, I, lo I hear your voice, Julie. I'm bending down even now to hear your cry. I mean, I sing the Bible to me. And I was having them do this. I saw him begin to weep. And so I asked for testimonies and he came forward very slowly and very, I mean, he's a beautiful English man. And, and he said, he said, I've always felt that I never belonged in the house and presence of the king. But when I sang that scripture and I sang out loud and I said, well, I've heard every word you've ever prayed. This grand." grandfather said I got it he heard he's heard every prayer and that day he knew he always belonged in the presence of the Lord and that's when I went this is a tool it's not the art of singing or the art of crafting a melody or the even the art of writing songs however if you sing the Bible you will write songs it's the tool I wanted to put the tool of singing the scripture in everyone's tool belt so I say if even your mama hates your voice because your mom loves everything about your kids it's still for you because it's not about being beautiful it's just about we might not all make the worship team but if we sing the Bible we will all get breakthrough it's the science of singing combined with singing this powerful powerful word that is alive and when you sing it it begins to work on the inside and and again the reason we sing is so that we put that helmet on so that we shut this down so that this how you explained it so perfectly that our true heart can connect with the heart of god and amen. that's the tool of singing amen and amen We've been talking with Julie Meyer, author of the new book, Singing the Scriptures, How All Believers Can Experience Breakthrough, Hope, and Healing. I know I experienced it just in this hour with you from our good friends at Chosen Books, a division of I've Baker chosen. Publishing, and we just uh, encourage you to get this and learn for yourself how you can perfect and go even deeper in your personal relationship with the Lord mm -hmm. by learning to sing the scriptures back to God. You are created to worship. If you don't know how, here's a handbook and a guidebook to lead you through to a place you've never been to before. Thank you so much, Julie, for being with us here on Revealing the Truth. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. And that brings to an end to our live broadcast day, but that doesn't mean we go off the air. All of today's shows, all of our shows can be found on our Facebook feed. Just click on video and see hundreds of our interviews, including this one, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and anywhere that you can find uh, our feed, including our WNDTV feed to the millions of people all across the world. We want to thank Julie Meyer and all our guests today. And until we see you back here, 9 a.m. Central Time, Monday morning, we bid you shalom and Shabbat Shalom.